Uh, now we'll talk about calibration coefficients. The output from the calorimeter, this heat conduction calorimeter, is, is not thermal power. I mean, the primary output, not thermal power. The output from the heat flow sensor is the voltage. So let's add that to the list in electrical voltage. Uh, and the unit is uh, volts. And I use the symbol U for that. Uh, now, the thermal power is proportional to the voltage. So P is the calibration coefficient, which we call epsilon here, times the voltage. And the calibration coefficient then has, vo has uh, units of watts per volt or milliwatts per millivolt. So we need to, we need to, uh, to find this coefficient so that we can calculate thermal powers from the voltages. Now, as for the baselines, this is sometimes done in commercial instruments automatically inside the instrument, but it's still good to know how you determine calibration coefficients so that you can value the results of your measurements. You can see if there is a, is a problem somewhere. Um, one important issue here is how often you need to calibrate. How often do I need to measure this coefficient? That is, how much does it change over time? Um, and that also includes how often do I need to measure baselines? Um, and this is, uh, this, is, this is not a trivial question. Both the calibration coefficient and the baselines are, in most calorimeters, very stable. Heat conducting calorimeters are stable <coughs> in instruments. And if you measure calibration coefficient, for example, over a year, you may see a change of a percent or so. It's uh, very small. So these, the normal level, these coefficients are very stable. Uh, the problem is that if something happens, if, if, if the instrument breaks down in some way, if it breaks down suddenly, completely, you'll see that. But if there is a gradual change, maybe there is a small crack in the heat flow sensor, then the calibration coefficient will start to change. And if you don't do regular calibration, you won't see this. If you use an old calibration coefficient, you won't see this. Um, and if you, let's say you, you make measurements for a long time, for a year maybe, and then you make a new calibration, and you find, oops, the calibration coefficient has changed by 25%. And uh, then you don't know when during this one year this change took place. So the question of how often you need to measure calibration coefficient and baseline is actually more a question of how, it can, it can be phrased as a question of how, how much data are you prepared to lose. Because you have to make a calibration before and a calibration after your measurement. And they, these calibration coefficients should be the same. Then you know that in this time period, the calibration coefficient was constant. Everything was good. But if it changes, then all the measurements you make since the earlier calibration are of doubtful quality. So this is, this is a, a problem. And some, in, in, in some type of measurements, you, you, when the data is really valuable or when you really need to have a good value of the calibration coefficient, you calibrate before each measurement. But normally don't do that. In industrial laboratories working with cement hydration, maybe they calibrate every month, every second month, or in some cases twice a year. Depends on what they're interested in. If you're only interested in the peak of a cement hydration curve, for example, when, when it takes place, then you don't need to calibrate at all, because then it's just the time, the time that's important. But if you want to measure peaks of hydration, for example, then the calibration copy is very important. Uh, so you should, when you know what type of measurement you're doing, you should think this over. How often do I need to calibrate and establish a calibration procedure and do that regularly so you have control of what you do? Um, yes. So in the next lecture, I will talk about electrical, electrical calibration, which is the most common way to make uh, calibrations. <laughs>